I, I'm going to talk about our successes and failures. After 20 years in the movement, I um, have a few ideas about that. I think, and thank you for inviting me here, Marcelo. I appreciate it so much. I am thrilled to see old friends and delighted to make some new friends. It's wonderful. Um, we have made progress in offering shelter and vocational options to women escaping prostitution. Real progress. We still have a way to go in terms of offering them the culturally and spiritually relevant psychological support needed to heal from the relentless verbal abuse in prostitution. They also need particular support to heal from the public's indifference. I'm mentioning this book by Judith Herman called Trauma and Recovery, The Aftermath of Violence from Domestic Abuse to Political Terror. I am certain that many people in the room have read this book. It's been translated into 40 languages. What Herman does is to take the Holocaust, domestic violence, and combat, and show the political threads of domestic terrorism, political terrorism, including prostitution. It's essential reading. It's bedrock reading for those in our field. It's a starting point. Psychotherapy and counseling for the prostituted must start with the understanding that prostitution is not sex work. It is a form of terrorism against women. Treating the mental and physical symptoms resulting from prostitution requires this understanding as a starting point. Acknowledging harms caused by paid for abuse is crucial. Recognizing victimization does not exclude the simultaneous recognition of strengths and creativity of survivors. You can do both. State of the art healing of trafficking and prostitution survivors could imitate the Danish model, the International Rehabilitation Council for Torture Victims. They have been doing this for 30 years. This is a holistic approach that includes access to justice, reparations, expert medical care, psychological counseling, and the expertise and support of other survivors in deconstructing the internalized propaganda about the sex trade. We've made progress, oops. Uh, we've made progress in recognizing the viciousness of pimping and trafficking, which is the same thing. We've made great progress. Most of the time, most women are pimped in prostitution. We've I'm constantly asked by media and people getting into the trafficking field, but what percentage are trafficked? What percentage are pimped? What, how many are under control? How many are making a free choice? The famous question. And finally, I thought, OK, I'm going to interview NGOs. I'm going to look at the data that's there. I looked at a Cells Foundation report on this, which pulls together experts like Manfred Paulus in Germany, an organized crime expert. And from a review of 18 reports on pimping in Europe, North America, and Asia, on average, 84% of adults, that should be adults, this is not talking about kids, we all agree on children. This is about adults in prostitution. 84% of adults in prostitution were pimped or trafficked 
or lacked alternatives, like the woman I mentioned yesterday who had to leave a meeting in order to perform five sex acts so she could buy food for children. We now understand that in addition to decriminalizing women and prostitution and offering them exit and support services as have been described here, if we want to abolish prostitution, we must hold men accountable for the harms they perpetrate against women in prostitution. A sex buyer explained, prostitution is where men have the freedom to do anything they want in a consequence-free environment. Another man put it a little more bluntly, prostitution is renting an organ for 10 minutes. Now, I love this cartoon. I'm, forgive me, I like cartoons. I'll, I'll do anything to try and get information across to people, and cartoons is a, helpful sometimes. This is done by a woman in strip club prostitution, and the, all of the men are saying the same thing in the strip club. I'm not like all the other guys in here. Um, our organization, Prostitution Research and Education, now in partnership with many, many other NGOs in the world, we've interviewed more than 700 sex buyers in five countries, and in one study, we compared sex buyers with men who do not buy sex. Here's what we found. There were differences. Men who buy sex tend to, one, prefer impersonal or non-relational sex. Where do you think they learned that? Two, they f tend to fear rejection by women. Three, they tell us that they have committed sexually aggressive acts in the past. Four, they have a hostile masculine self-identification. They define themselves as men by dominance, by putting women down. Five, they have a history of sexual violence. Six, they said that they were more likely to rape if they could get away with it than men who had not bought sex. Another study, which is a phenomenal study, brought together several NGOs in a remarkable study of risk factors contributing to men's decision to rape women. It's looking at the same question we were looking at, but from a different perspective. The researchers obtained huge samples of more than 1,000 men each in Chile, Croatia, India, Mexico, and Rwanda. I don't know if you can see the numbers up at the top. In all five countries, men who acknowledged paying for sex in prostitution are more likely to commit rape than men who had never paid for sex. This is a very strong finding. It cannot be ignored in our educational development policies and in our legal advocacy. I was, uh, now people who benefit from, promote, and profit from the sex trade do not want to hear this kind of research study. Sex work advocates conduct disinformation campaigns that marginalize and controversialize this kind of study. 
I have a handout that's on the table now that shows how the same strategies used to deny the facts of climate science are the same strategies used to deny the facts of the harms of prostitution. It's the same methodology, debunking of science, minimizing of results, saying the researchers are quacks, crazy, etc. At another at a conference on climate disruption where there was an urgent discussion on how can we help people shift into high gear action on protecting the planet, one person said that those of us in this room, and I think it applies to us here too, those of us in the room might be motivated by things that are a little different, a passion for justice, a passion for equality, we might be motivated a little differently than people in the world generally. And we better think about that. What we're all motivated by, humans, is self-interest. Now, in the case of pro non-prostituted women, like me, it's in our personal interest to end prostitution. The line between prostitution and non-prostitution is disappearing. Today, the Me Too campaign is about women's voices talking about sexual harassment and rape, generally non-prostituting women's voices. Today in the Me Too campaign, we're hearing about rich, usually white men who coerce sex acts on actresses who want a job, right? That's what got the publicity rolling. Let me give you a few survivors, survivors of prostitution. Let me give you their voices on the Me Too campaign because I wanted to hear from them. Something was bothering me about this. Evelina Giobi, the founder of Whisper, Women Hurt, in Systems of Prostitution Engaged in Revolt. How's that for a title? Um, Evelina said, prostitution is not like anything else. Rather, everything else is like prostitution because it's the model for women's condition. Prostitution sets the parameters for what you can do to a woman. So I would ask, does Me Too include prostituted women? Because sexual harassment is what prostitution is. If you remove sexual harassment, there is no prostitution. Sex trade survivors' voices are essential to a discussion of sexual harassment, rape, and male supremacy. Elisa Bernard at the Organization for Prostitution Survivors in Seattle said, prostitution is the definition of a hostile work environment. What angers me is our inability to be heard when we talk about our victimization. Why? Because it's considered a job. This is, what, uh, this is where I would agree with Rachel Moran. We can't consider it a job because that says, go on, do it, you belong there, and we leave her there. It's not a job, it's a human rights violation. Vanita Carter, founder of Breaking Free in Minneapolis, said, Weinstein and Trump are no different from everyday Johns or punters. They rape women because they can, telling themselves she wanted it or she liked it. I don't know 
if you can, oh, you can't see the words too much. This is a, a cartoon a friend of mine did. Up at the top, she's saying, sorry, sir, I'm not a prostitute. I just wait on tables here. The second one down, he's saying, well, how was I to know you look like one? And she says, really? How is that? And he says, you have breasts, don't you? Now, in conclusion, what I would say is we need standards of care for those healing from prostitution. It's in all of our interests to better understand why men buy sex so that we can teach young men alternatives. And it's in the interests of all women, not only prostituted and trafficked women, to abolish the institution of prostitution. Thank you. Thank you.